especially with the findings of the uh, IG report. I mean, come on, this is your best choice? I mean, hello, you have Joe Biden. Nor would be, there be anything to stop someone from placing Joe Biden's name in nomination. I don't think people are laughing at the idea of a Biden-Warren ticket any longer. I had planned on running. Um, it's an awful thing to say. Uh, I, I think I would have been the best president. Welcome to The Hardline. I'm John Bachman. Ed Berliner is off again this weekend. As Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders continue to duke it out for the presidential nomination on the Democratic side, a familiar name surfaces that could turn the race upside down. Donald Trump's media bashing averts attention from some very unflattering information surfacing from the Trump University court case. And will Trump change the GOP or will the GOP change Donald Trump? A big question there. Lots to get to tonight. Let's start with Newsmax political analyst, best-selling author, of many leather-bound books, including Power Grab, Obama's Dangerous Plan for a One-Party Nation. Dick Morris joining us. Dick, great to talk with you. Good to be with you, John. All right, let's talk about this scenario, uh, the Biden ultimatum. I, I like to call it a little joke there, but uh, Joe Biden emerging uh, more pro trouble for Hillary Clinton. W tell us why you think Joe Biden is a lot of guys Democrats are thinking about right now. Well, the math is pretty interesting. Uh, there are 781 delegates remaining to be chosen by the Democratic Party, and they'll be chosen on uh, Monday and Tuesday of next week, and those will be it. They'll all be chosen. And Hillary is still 613 votes short of what she needs for the nomination uh, in pledge delegates uh, short. So she, to win the nomination, she's going to have to get the votes of two or three or four hundred of the 712 superdelegates uh, who, are, who are given a sense of the convention by virtue of their places in the party, state chairman, state committee, committeemen, and so on. And they're not bound to vote for anyone. They can switch right up to the last minute. So if you look in June and you see Hillary may be losing California, getting slammed by the Benghazi report, uh, getting crucified by the FBI, uh, indicted or not indicted, but at least clearly found in the wrong. And then you begin to see polling that shows Trump ahead of Hillary by increasing amounts, but Biden defeating Trump. It's very possible, I think, that three or four hundred of the superdelegates might get together and say, hey, look, we are not going to vote for Hillary. We're going to vote for Biden because we think he's the only one that can win. And then you could get enough delegates, enough superdelegates going for Biden to deny Hillary, the first ballot nomination to deny the two to three hundred that she needs. And uh, it's easy to see how that could happen. And that would force it to a second ballot where all pledges are off and you can vote for whoever you want, elected or superdelegates. And it's easy to see the convention stampeding uh, for Biden. Now, uh, that's a bunch of ifs. A lot of but ifs. Accelerating the process is that Barack Obama might want to encourage that. Uh, Biden will probably want to encourage that. And I could see in the middle of the month with Hillary is getting bad poll numbers and getting knocked all over the place and maybe losing California, that Biden could indicate his availability. And then first hesitantly and then in larger numbers, superdelegates could come out for him until it becomes clear that Hillary cannot get a first ballot nomination. Sure. And I think uh, according to the latest numbers, if you do include the superdelegates, Hillary Clinton is now less than 100 delegates away from, from showing up the nomination. But as you mentioned, those superdelegates can change at any point. I, I want to talk about this. Uh, go ahead. John, because they're, uh, they can vote for anybody. Right. And uh, their commitments don't matter. The important number is that Hillary is 631 votes shy of the nomination. And she'll probably get about 300 of the 781 delegates, or 350, that are being selected next week, which will bring her only about, two, will bring about 230, 250 votes shy of enough for the nomination. And at that point, I think the superdelegates could play a crucial role in the process. You got to think, Dick, too, there's some tipping point at which Hillary Clinton becomes vulnerable. Uh, and there's a lot of the superdelegates who may be just supporting Hillary Clinton because she was at one time the inevitable nominee. And if it starts to, to change, it'll change very quickly at that point. Uh, they are afraid of Bernie Sanders. Right. 
Right. Well, let's talk about Bernie Sanders. He was on uh, some uh, this liberal news show, The Young Turks. I don't know if you watch regularly. I I'm going to guess you probably don't, Dick. But he was asked specifically about Joe Biden <laughs> being brought into the race at the convention to take the nomination. Here's how Sanders responded. I think that would be a terrible, terrible idea. And what that would say to the millions of people who have supported us, who have worked with us, uh, to say, uh, you know, all of your energy, uh, all of your votes, all of your beliefs are relevant. We're going to bring in somebody else. I happen to like Joe a lot, uh, but I think that would be a very, very serious blunder for the Democratic Party. Yeah, when, when Bernie Sanders talks about we, Dick, the problem is that he, he wasn't in that we up until he started running for president. Well, I think that he, uh, he'll say that now right. because he wants people to vote for him on Tuesday, uh, uh, this coming Tuesday. Uh, but once that's over, and it becomes clear that Hillary has more elected delegates than he does, but that because of the superdelegates, she's shy of the nomination, then I could see Sanders calling on the superdelegates to support him, and then I could see them supporting Biden. The halfway house in this might be that Sanders might file a motion at the convention to change the rules so they replicate the rules in the Republican Party that bind the superdelegates to vote the way their states voted. And if that's the case, then uh, Biden is very close to Hillary. I haven't seen any math on that, uh, but it would be a very, very close contest. And in that procedural vote, any delegate can vote however they want. But I think that you're going to see, you may well see, if June is as bad for Hillary as it looks like it is, an emerging groundswell from among the superdelegates to say, hey, wait a minute, we're about to nominate someone who is unelectable and Donald Trump is about to be president, and that's something we want to avoid at all costs, which is how the Democrats would be thinking. Yeah, President Obama talking about uh, politics 2016 today, going back to where he announced or began his presidential campaign in Illinois. Uh, but you got to think, Dick, who does President Obama feel most comfortable with uh, securing his legacy as the next president? It's not Hillary Clinton. It's certainly not no. Bernie Sanders. It's got to be Joe Biden. Absolutely. So, so there are a lot of factors here that are waiting to snap into place. Now, if Hillary does well and wins the California primary on Tuesday and wins some of the others and is maybe 100, 150 elected delegates short of the nomination, and uh, if the uh, Benghazi report has no smoking gun and the FBI kind of takes a pass at this, um, you know, then I think she'll cruise into the nomination. Yeah, and, and Dick, to go back to what you were saying before, there's a lot of ifs in that scenario uh, as well. I want to go ahead and open up the phone lines. We've got a lot more to get to, but let's welcome in some guests. If you have any questions for Dick Morris, you can get on right now. Call us at 1-877-NEWSMAX. Uh, we want to hear your thoughts on this, and we'll get to some of those calls very shortly. Uh, but I also want to talk about something that I thought, thought was curious and a new Rasmussen poll, uh, Dick. 71% of Democrats who were polled in this believe that Hillary Clinton should continue her run of the White House, even if she is indicted. And, and this uh, speaks to the fact that Democrats don't care about this, but look at the independent number, 46%. Almost half of them believe that, that she should still continue. Overall, 50% of those Democrats, Republicans, and independents believe that she should continue to run even if she is indicted. What do those numbers say to you? John, 51% of the Democrats would like her to continue to run even if she's dead. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> they want to stop Donald Trump at all costs. And they don't much care who's in, indicted, she's indicted. Uh, they'll vote for, vote for her until she's clinically removed from the ballot. Uh, that's not an affirmation for Hillary, and it's not a forgiveness for an, forgiveness for an indictment. It's a testament to the fear that Donald Trump has ar arose or arisen as a result of Trump's candidacy in the Democratic base. I'll have to look at the way that question is, is, is worded closely because I, I, I don't believe that uh, 50 or 71 percent of Democrats would want her to run if she was indicted. I believe, Dick, that if she does in fact get indicted and they ask that question after the indictment, the hypothetical indictment were to come down, that 71 percent says she should get out and they would be backing Joe Biden. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I think that it's very important for us to realize that Biden has not been out there as an alternative. Right. And for a whole lot of the votes that she's getting, are people who are afraid of Bernie Sanders or afraid of Donald Trump. And uh, put Biden into that mix and it could all change very quickly. And if Obama is quietly behind the Biden bit, you have to wonder why Obama has not endorsed anybody, why Obama has not supported Hillary. 
And um, it's interesting, and it may be just to leave that particular door wide open. I mean, you, you could make the argument, and I think this is the official line from the White House, that uh, President Obama isn't going to endorse anybody, doesn't think it would be appropriate until the nominee is actually selected. But you don't buy that. No, I don't. Uh, presidents make up their own rules. Right. Bill Clinton certainly let everybody know that he wanted Al Gore to be the nominee. Uh, there was no question about it. He openly endorsed him, and even as Bill Bradley was mounting a spirited challenge to him, he made that very, very clear. And do you think uh, th there's some sort of negotiation going on now? I mean, th I guess California is uh, decision day. And, and who could, well, who could have guessed that it was going to come down to California for the Democrats? We were talking about Republicans months ago, but the Democrats not deciding it until California. Well, it's too soon right now for there to be a Biden movement. The trial balloon is good enough. Uh, you have to wait till California. If Hillary wins California by 10 points and she's continuing to and she leads Trump in the polling, uh, she'll survive the Benghazi report. And short of an indictment, she'll survive the FBI report. But, uh, but if she loses California, and that's why she's out there now frantically campaigning, uh, it could be a very different story. And at the moment, the polling has her about even with Sanders, and usually Sanders does better in open primaries on election day. I'll give you one stat. The number of de people who are registering as Democrats, newly registering as Democrats, is running 40 percent higher than it did four years ago in California. So people are switching into the Democratic primary uh, probably to vote for Sanders because Hillary said she doesn't need their votes. It's all over. Yeah, one last question, Dick. We only have about 30 seconds left to go. Yes or no. Do you believe that someplace somewhere in an office in Washington, D.C., they are beginning the contingency plan just in case Joe Biden has to be the guy because you just can't start a presidential campaign by flipping on a light switch? Well, I think they went pretty far down that road before Biden took himself out in January. So is it waiting? I mean, do they all have to do is turn the key on the door and get things back going again? Is it that easy? That's true. And, you know, he doesn't need to have get on the ballot. He doesn't need petitions in each state. He can just begin at the convention. He doesn't have to amass name recognition or get himself known nationally. He has a good running head start to do that. And there would be such a sigh of relief yeah. that it's Hillary that it could impel him to a very early lead. And he would have not had to lower himself to a primary campaign. That's every politician would love to see. Dick Morris is sticking around. We got much more to come. We're going to talk about a kind of creepy new Hillary Clinton web ad. I'll see why you might be creeped out after this. Dick Moore is coming back. 877 Newsmax. Call us. And welcome back to The Hardline. I'm John Bachman, filling in for Ed Berliner this week. We're talking with Newsmax political analyst and best-selling author Dick Moore is continuing the conversation. And you can join us as well when you feel like it. Pique your interest, something you want to talk about, call us, one eight seven seven newsmax uh, Dick, I want to continue our conversation talking about Hillary Clinton's inability uh, to close out Bernie Sanders uh, and also try to destroy Donald Trump. This was Rush Limbaugh in his theory yesterday as to why the Clinton campaign cannot destroy Donald Trump. If Trump were any other Republican, they would have practically destroyed him by now, and they'd be worried about rehabbing Hillary's image and building her up, but she's so unexciting, she's so dull, she's so scandal-ridden, they got nothing to work with. All they can do is try to destroy Trump. But they don't know how, because they didn't make Trump, they can't destroy Trump. True, Dick, I'm watching Hillary Clinton's speech earlier today, uh, and she's reading from her script and her teleprompter, and she has to look down to call Donald Trump a fraud. She says, uh, this is more reason, more evidence as to why Donald Trump is a fraud. So calculated. Uh, is this a problem with Hillary? Why can't she get past this? Why can't she be someone else? Well, <laughs> she tries very hard to be someone else, but uh, she isn't able to, particularly not in comparison with her husband. Um, is that part fact, of the problem? You always, you always compare her uh, to the charismatic char uh, charismatic candidate that Bill Clinton was? Yes. Uh, it's kind of like the son of a famous father, a mm. daughter of a famous father. We're always comparing the one to the other and sometimes finding them wanting. Uh, but I think that in this case, Hillary has no message. She has no issues and she has no message. Uh, Bernie Sanders' message is so clear. The top one percent. 
And Donald Trump's message is so clear. Keep the Muslims out and build a wall. Hillary Clinton has no message at all. So her campaign has to be wall-to-wall -wall negatives. Now, she can go negative against Trump, but she can't go negative against Sanders because she doesn't want to alienate his voters because they are precisely the voters Hillary needs in order to get elected herself. If you took a poll of everybody that might end up voting for Hillary in the next election, you'd find a majority of them are voting for Sanders now. Mm. That's interesting. And we'll take that poll. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we'll get to a couple of callers in just a second, Dick. But I want to talk about that Clinton, that new web ad from Hillary Clinton, because clearly her campaign uh, is self-conscious to the fact that she is so calculated uh, and and scripted. And they're, they're trying to combat that with this ad. But I just don't think it came across exactly as they intended. Let's take a look. <laughs> distracting standing up here looking at him. So, so I'm going to look over this way, and I'm going to look over that way. <laughs> I'm going to look back there. Okay, so, as I was saying. All right, so that's Hillary Clinton talking about how sh distracted she was by two shirtless uh, teen, early 20 young males in the audience, you know, we know there's a double standard here, Dick, but what if the roles were reversed and Donald Trump was talking about two scantily clad young ladies in the front row of his audience? I don't think uh, there'd be a lot of political consultants out there saying, let's make an ad about this. Yeah. Uh, watching that ad is like watching your mother drunk. <laughs> oh, gosh. I think, I've, unfortunately, I've experienced that. Uh, no offense, Mom, but uh, yeah, probably one of those things you don't want to see every single day. But there's an interesting dynamic here. Hillary knows that she is not the charismatic person that Bill is. And she sees how effortlessly he attracts people and he gets people's attention and admiration. And she knows she can't do that. So what she usually does is resort to lying. She says, oh, I'm not just Hillary. I was named after the guy who climbed Mount Everest. Uh, I went to try to join the Marines. You know, when I landed in Bosnia, I had to dodge sniper bullets. All stuff to make her more exciting and make her more attractive to the audience so that she can be by her circumstances what Bill Clinton is naturally. And it doesn't work. She feels the deficit. And there's not much that she can do about it. You remember when uh, they talked about whether Hillary was likable enough and Obama turned to her in the debate and said, you're likable enough, Hillary. That was such a great response. Even if you don't like Obama, that was classic. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and bring in Roberta, who's calling us from Grape Valley, New York. Hey, like Roberta. you, Dick, she thinks Hillary Clinton can't tell the truth. How, how are you doing, Roberta? I'm doing good. Hello, John. Hello, Dick. I enjoy your program. When I can get it, Dish Network took you off. Yes, that's unfortunate. You can still find us on NewsmaxTV.com, Roku, Apple TV. There's, there's plenty of ways you can find us. Don't fret. I uh, know. What's your question? I'm 70 years old. We're on a strict budget. I live out in the country, and I can't afford to get the Internet. So... I just have to hope Dish Network gets you guys back. Well, call them. Okay. Call them and let them know. What's your question or comment for Dick? I've already done that. What's your question? My, I don't have a question, but I'm going to tell you something. I worked my first campaign with my daddy. I was seven years old for the Democrats, and we passed out flyers for Adelaide Stevenson. <clears throat> I also made phone calls for Hillary Clinton when she ran for the Senate. And, la and when she ran for the presidency, and I'm going to tell you something, my husband and I have both switched. We are now Republicans. We are voting for Donald Trump. And Hillary Clinton wouldn't know the truth if it jumped up and bit her in the butt. Well, I, you know, I, I, as shocking as that might sound to some people, that is, she, Roberta is probably the 50th person uh, over the last two months that has said almost exactly the same thing, Dick. I have a question for Roberta. Is she still on the air? Yes. Uh, are they, do they give you a patch, like a nicotine patch, to help you recover from your Hillary addiction? Boy, I'm telling you, I didn't need one. 
when <laughs> everything came out with ben- Benghazi, and then I got to thinking back to the Clinton years and everything that went on from there, uh, a light bulb went off in my head, and it was like, where have you been? Yeah, that's, that's right. like that's that's it like was, that hangover you wake up with and you swear exactly, off alcohol. Exactly, like when life. you're in college and you wake up the next morning. Yeah, exactly. That was the last time. All right, Roberta. Hillary, thanks. Yeah, go Hillary, ahead. Hillary, when she's asked a question, the truth does not automatically favor itself as a potential response. Uh, she looks at four or five different responses, plays out in her mind what will work politically. What will work with the audience? What will work with the TV audience? What stage of the campaign am I at? And then she chooses an answer. And if it is the truth, what a happy coincidence. And if it's not, who cares? Uh, The issue is, can anyone disprove it? And that's how Hillary's mind works. Hillary is deeply convinced that she is the last best person on earth. And if she has to violate a few rules and not tell the truth, hey, that comes with the territory. Mother Teresa wants to feed the poor, so she hijacks a jet to get there faster. That's Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Well, Roberta, thanks for calling in. Uh, next up is Steve from Boulder, Colorado. Uh, Steve, thanks for being with us. Do you have a question for Dick or myself? Hey, Steve. Uh, how yes, you doing? I do. Well, a comment and a question. But, uh, you know, I don't, we've, ne- we've always been known not to ever leave somebody behind. First, she does this stuff in Benghazi. And she's getting away with it. And, you know, I think there was some kind of proof that people were ready to go in and save them, but they told them to stand down. But anyway, I want to know, she should be in jail just for having an unsecured server, and she should automatically lose her security license. And at that point, she is no longer valid to run for president, I would think. It would, that's what they would do yeah. to any one of us. That's an interesting point that Steve brings up. Dick, is there any scenario under which if Hillary Clinton were to be indicted, you know, the, the candidates, they get security briefings sometimes, it's, it's secretive. Is there anything that would prevent her from receiving those if she were uh, subject no, uh, to a criminal case? No, a president is not subject to uh, a security review uh, and uh, automatically has top security clearance regardless. Of what about the nominees? before I mean, the election actually happens? Because don't they get briefed sometimes uh, would, with, with important would information? That, that would fall into the same category. But uh, about the Benghazi situation, I think that it's not just that she left them behind. It's not just that she played a role in scotching the reinforcements. It's that after it happened, for two months, she lied to us and tried to convince us that it was not a pre-planned terror attack but a spontaneous demonstration about a movie that went crazy. And even in the face of mounting proof, she continued to hew to that lie. Uh, absolutely incredible. Yeah. I, you know, and I'm not saying that she committed a crime. We'll let the FBI and the courts determine that. But it's always the case, if you go back in politics, Dick, it's not what actually occurred. It's what happened after the cover-up or the attempt to cover-up that usually gets these folks in trouble. Let me, let me give you a very good example here. All right, we've got 30 the, seconds. The IG report reveals that Justin Cooper, Bill Clinton's aide, no security clearance, was the guy who operated the server. How is that different from General Petraeus giving it to his biographer? Well, we know the Clinton campaign would say it's electronic versus digital. I don't think that makes a hill of beans difference to anybody out there who's voting. Dick Morris, as always, great to see you. Can't wait to talk to you again real soon. Have a great one. I got much more coming up. Who's going to change the Republican Party more? Donald Trump? For somebody else, maybe a third-party candidate.